This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, Lake Fenton United Methodist Church. I am Karen Whitaker, and I am a longtime member of this wonderful church. I am the guest speaker this morning. Pastor Vince is at a worship and preaching summit conference this weekend, and we know he will be with us in spirit as we worship together. As you may know, we've decided to halt in-person worship for a bit and just meet virtually for a while. The COVID numbers have been on the rise, and for the safety of the congregation, we thought we should err on the side of caution. Even though we can't be together physically, we can still greet one another and fellowship virtually. If you are joining us on Facebook, I encourage you to let us know that you are with us. And if the Spirit moves you, send a message of love and peace so others gathered here this morning can hear your voice virtually. This morning, we are in for a treat. As you know, we have some very talented musicians here at the Lake Fenton United Methodist Church, and one of those people is Huey Judson. He has a very talented family as well. A while ago, we heard Addie and Macy, his two granddaughters, sing. And this morning, you are going to get the opportunity to meet some more of his precious grandchildren. These grandchildren have attended our VBS, and we are so glad they've decided to join us this morning. So I introduce to you, from left to right, Genevieve, or Gigi for short, Amani, Grandpa, Kingston, James is a behind-the-scenes kind of guy. He's holding the cue cards, and of course, their wonderful, awesome mother, Julie Jo, is on the camera. Enjoy. This is for Karen. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, yes Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, as he loved so long ago, taking children on his knee, saying, let them come to me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Bring the confetti. Now that had to put a smile on your face. Jesus does love us. Thank you again, Genevieve, Amani, Kingston, James, Julie, Joe, and Huey. So nice that you could visit us this morning and make our service that much more special. I would now invite you to join with me in the reading of the Apostles' Creed. It will be led by Pastor Vince. The words will appear on your screen so you can follow along. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It saddens me that we will not be passing out popcorn this weekend for the homecoming parade, and we won't be welcoming our trick-or-treaters for the holy halls of Halloween. 
Two ways that we regularly reach out to our community have fallen victim to the COVID this year. I don't know how we're gonna survive not knowing what Diane is gonna dress up like. I'm crossing my fingers that she sends us some pictures. As unfortunate as that is, we still have events that we're looking forward to. Christmas is just around the corner, and each year we participate in Operation Christmas Child. And once again, we'll be collecting shoeboxes full of presents for boys and girls. They will be due on November 15th. We are also hoping to put on our annual Christmas program, even if it tends to be virtual this year. This program is a ministry of song and entertainment that we love to share with our Lake Fenton community. We hope that you will continue to support our outreach and our ministries, even if they look a bit different. At the bottom of your screen, you will see an address for the church where you can continue to mail in your tithes and offerings, as well as a link to our PayPal where you can do donate online. Well, it's been a little quieter at the Whitaker house this week. My husband and son went on their annual hunting trip into Everett, Mich Michigan. Yep, we're going to do that one more time. Well, it's been a little quieter at the Whitaker house this week. My husband and son are up north hunting for their annual bow hunting trip in Everett, Michigan, which means the girls got the house to themselves. We've been binge watching some Netflix, eating some chocolate, getting takeout. It's been pretty rough. Of course, we've also been preparing for this morning's service. I couldn't do it without them. Casey came to the church with me today to start my fire and get me all set up here. And Trisha, of course, does all of the editing and, and takes care of all of that. Now, it's not an easy job, but Pastor Vince does it every week. And I mentioned that he was at a conference, which means he's not off the clock. He does an awful lot for this church, and I really appreciate it. I don't know how he does it. He doesn't have a tech person or a person to start his fire, and yet he provides that for us every week. So let's keep him in our prayers this week. Let's also take a moment to raise up any praises or concerns that you might have as we bow our head and go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Pastor Vince, and we pray that you bless him and his family we are so thankful for his talents and his diligence as he guides us through worship each week. We pray for our nation as we seem to continually become more and more divided. Help us, Lord, to be kind to one another. We also ask you to provide healing to the sick and comfort to those that hurting. We pray for good news on test results and peace as we wait for those answers. We pray for treatments and vaccines so that we might find a way to control the spread of COVID. And though there seems to be so many troubles in our world, Help us to see the many gifts that you have given us that provide us with joy and happiness. We thank you, Lord, for, for beautiful fall days full of colorful landscapes and crisp morning air. We thank you for friends that call on us just to say hello and ask how we're doing. And we thank you, Lord, for technology that gives us connection with our friends and our family and our church. We ask all of this in your name as we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, we will join Kamea as she reads the scripture reading for today. This morning's scripture reading comes from Ruth chapter 1, verse 10 through 18. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to another son or could grow up to be your husband? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more better, bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. And again, they wept together, and Opa kissed her mother-in-law, Goodbye, but Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. My, may the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Kamea. She's not one for reading, but she did it for her mother. So this morning, I would like to tell you the story about two people, Sean and Jordan. We find them in a very difficult situation. They have been taken prisoner and have been locked in a room with no way out. This is an unusual room. In the middle of the room, there's this large hole that is so deep that you cannot see the bottom. But coming up from the middle of the hole, it's a small fire that fills the room with warmth. Now hanging above the fire is a large cast iron pot that has the most tantalizing aroma that floats through the room. Leaning in the corner, there's a pole that looks to be long enough to probably reach that pot. Now at the beginning of this situation, Sean and Jordan were pretty hopeful that at some point they would be released. But in the meantime, they took solace in the warmth of the room and the company of one another. Ultimately, their goal was simply to survive. They would talk about their families and the friends that they missed. They shared their joys and their fears with one another as they tried to hold on. For days, the two tried to figure a way to reach that pot of soup hanging in the middle of the room. But the ominous hole was terrifying to look at, and neither of them wanted to get too close. Sean was sure that the pole was the key. He would hold it in his hand and ponder, tapping that handle on the ground as he thought. Jordan would sit a ways away and watch Sean and sigh mournfully as she wished they could reach that bubbling goodness. One day, Sean stopped tapping the pole and finally did it. He reached the handle out across the hole to the pot. He could no longer bear the hunger. Standing on the edge of the hole, he tried to slip the long pole under the handle of the pot and lift it up. But the pole was too weak and it began to bend. Jordan sighed so loudly that it startled Sean, and he almost knocked the pot into the bottomless hole. 
He shot, shot her a menacing glance and pulled the pole back and his tapping resumed. Days passed and hunger was getting the best of them. Sean's tapping seemed to be getting louder and Jordan's sighing was much more dramatic and more frequent. They would stare at that pot as their stomachs grumbled and turned. Their mouths would salivate as they imagined the deliciousness that was so close but so far away. And then Sean looked up at the pole in his hand and suddenly he noticed that the end looked different. He flipped it over and examined it a little closer and noticed that he had not seen before that the end looked to have a spoon end on it. Jordan was now on her feet and at John, Sean's side. She scolded him for not seeing it sooner. Sean ignored her and carefully navigated the spoon to the pot. He managed to scoop out a heaping spoonful of soup, but then suddenly realized that no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't put that soup in his mouth due to the length of the handle. Jordan begged, let me try. But Sean wouldn't give up the spoon. Try after try, Sean would scoop out the soup, but eventually it would spill and fall back into the bowl. Sean worked hour upon hour until he was so exhausted that he fell asleep. Jordan had been waiting for a chance to grab the spoon. And finally, she had her opportunity. She snagged the spoon for herself. She too could get food on the spoon, but couldn't figure out how to feed herself. And like Sean, she would lose the soup down into that deep bowl. Every time she dumped the soup, she would sigh mournfully. Her sighs were so loud that they woke Sean from his deep sleep. Would you stop that incessant sighing, he screamed, as he yanked the spoon out of her hands. Sean instantly started tapping that spoon on the ground again. I would if you stopped tapping the pole. Tap, 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 tap. You're driving me crazy, Jordan snapped. Well, maybe if you got off your butt and helped me instead of constantly sighing like you were a dying cow, Sean shot back. Well, maybe if you'd stop hogging the pole, Jordan grumbled as she snatched the spoon out of his hands. With that, Sean gave Jordan a push, and Jordan pushed back, and pushing turned into shoving, and shoving turned into hitting, and soon they were rolling on the ground, and then it happened. Somehow in the middle of the ruckus, the spoon snapped in half. They were both stunned as they looked at that broken spoon. It was way too short to even come close to the pot hanging in the middle of the room now. And then the arguing continued. Sean accused Jordan and Jordan accused Sean. They called each other names, cursed each other out. There were tears, disappointment, and pain. They argued until they were so hoarse that they could no longer speak. Eventually, they both curled up in a ball and went to sleep. But the smell of the simmering soup woke them once more, and their stomachs still ached with hunger. The pot hung in the middle of the room, seeming to taunt them. They were both sore from the fight the night before. They had bumps and bruises, but they were both still alive. And they sat there staring at the pot. And then almost simultaneously, they looked to where they had left the broken spoon. And to their amazement, the spoon was no longer broken. It had miraculously been repaired as they slept. Both of them leapt to their feet and ran towards the spoon, but Jordan was just a hair faster and she grabbed that spoon. Sean was too tired to fight. And so he just slumped down to the ground and he began to weep. Jordan looked at the spoon in her hand and looked at Sean, and suddenly she was ashamed of her actions. Her thoughts of feeding herself faded as she had an epiphany. She took the spoon and reached out to the pot and loaded it with hearty soup. Carefully, she removed the spoon and had it cross the hole carefully, put it up to Sean's mouth. 
He slowly took a bite, and a smile crossed his face as he slurped the warm nutrients he had so long desired. And then Sean gently took the spoon from Jordan, and he repeated the same procedure and fed Jordan. The two continued to take turns feeding one another until they were both full. It took Jordan's actions of compassion to find a solution. In today's Bible reading, we heard the story of Ruth and Naomi. Now, if you remember the story, Naomi, her husband and two sons, were living in Bethlehem. But due to a famine, they were both forced to move to the land of Moab, Israel's ancient enemy. Unfortunately, Naomi's husband dies, but her two sons end up marrying Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. <laughs> Tragically, both of Naomi's sons die as well. The women are left alone to try to survive. Now, as we know, in biblical times, Women were dependent on the men to provide for them. So Naomi knew that her options were limited, and she decided that she would return to Bethlehem. She loves her daughter-in-laws, but she has no way to support them. Even if Naomi was to find a new husband, she is way too old to have children. But let's say, for the sake of argument, let's just pretend that Naomi did find a husband, and she did have more children. It's absurd to believe that Orpah and Ruth would wait around for those children to grow up so that they could marry them. The whole scenario is ridiculously unrealistic. But Orpah and Ruth begged Naomi. Their love is so great for her that they cannot bear leaving her. But no husbands is just part of the problem. Naomi also knows that they could suffer great discrimination if they were to return to Bethlehem. Moabites and Israelites were sworn enemies, and they would struggle to be accepted. Naomi tells or Orpah and Ruth that they must stay behind and find new husbands. Reluctantly, Orpah takes Naomi's advice, but Ruth clings to Naomi, refusing to leave her side. She proclaims, wherever you go, I will go. Your people will be my people, and your God will become my God. Imagine what Ruth was sacrificing. She was leaving her homeland to go somewhere she is probably not wanted. The possibility of her finding a new husband in Bethlehem is about as plausible as Naomi getting pregnant again. They don't know where they're going to stay when they get there or how they'll find food to eat. But none of this changes Ruth's mind. Regardless of the mounting odds against Ruth, she will not back down. Her loyalty to Naomi is just something, isn't something she just professes, but it's an action she takes as she accompanies Naomi to her homeland. Actions speak louder than words. We have heard this all of our lives, and nothing could be more true. Words are spoken and written and may be persuasive and sincere, but words with no actions are empty and hollow. It's Ruth's loyalty to Naomi that compels Ruth to journey with Naomi to Bethlehem. In fact, Ruth didn't even worship the same God as Naomi until she made her proclamation. Your God will become my God. Could you imagine not only leaving your homeland and your way of life, but abandoning your God to follow and worship another God? I discovered that one of the most interesting aspects of the story of Ruth and Naomi is that God is never described as being active or even present throughout the entire book of Ruth. Although God may not be mentioned as the one who orchestrates the series of events, his presence is apparent 
and the actions of the characters. Ruth's actions of love and compassion portray her as an obedient follower of the Lord. Ruth invites God into her life, and it is this action that makes her so memorable. Kids Hope was a ministry our church participated in for a few years a while back. It was unfortunate when it ended, but there were still so many lessons that we can take away from it today. This mission was to send in mentors from our church to spend one hour a week with an elementary student. The mentors could do many different things with their mentee. Pat Mance would always take art projects. Chuck Irwin would take his mentee down to the gym to play basketball. Others would read books, play games. They would listen to them tell about their week, and so often we would help them with their homework. What we weren't allowed to do was talk about God. We were from a church, but we were in the school, so that was not part of the program. Now, of course, God was always present. Each mentor and mentee had a prayer partner that would pray for both of them all week long. But sharing Bible verses or talking about beliefs with our kids it was a firm no. You see, the premise was that we wouldn't need to talk about God because our actions would let them see and feel God's love through us. Our actions would represent our loyalty to God and in return lead others to him. So the mentors would show up every week. They would listen when the child needed them to listen. They would laugh when the child needed laughter. The mentors would be tough if it was needed, but they would play when play was needed. No matter what, that mentor always showed up. It was their actions that invited God into the room. We have Christians have an obligation to shine the light of Jesus Christ. Our choices we make and the way we behave has an impact on how others perceive the church as a whole, how they perceive Christianity, and how they perceive God. As I sat at work last week, a song kept looping in my head. And before I knew it, I was humming it. It wasn't a song that I'd heard on the radio, and, and honestly, I can't remember the last time I heard it, but there it was, rattling around in my head. It was the hymn, They Will Know We Are Christians By Our Love. How ironic, I thought, as I hummed the tune. I'm not sure that our love is apparent at the moment. There is a sense of discourse in the world, and Christians seem to be contributing to the madness just as, as much as anyone else. We cannot go around fighting over long-handled spoons. We need to start feeding one another. If we could just emulate the aura of Ruth, we would find ourselves using our actions to demonstrate unconditional love. And of course, according to Kids Hope, our mission is to be the hands and feet of Christ. And our actions are what are noticed and remembered. So I encourage you to take action and invite God into the next room you enter. Invite God into the grocery store. Invite God into your car during rush hour traffic. Invite God into your next argument with family your loved ones, and invite God into Facebook, God forbid, when he is in the room, our actions reflect his presence, when God is in the room, our actions will spread his word, and when God is in the
Blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 